I'm just going to go ahead and say it because I get asked a lot. It's like, so you're saying they go replace doctors. I think it's a matter of semantics. I think in, in some way, in a large way, it will replace doctors for a lot of the things doctors do. Does the role and need of a doctor go away? No, I think that's timeless. And that's why it's been around forever. Um, it may be on, on more of a, you know, qualitative appreciation of, of what is suffering, right? And, and those metrics that the AI is able to retrieve and say, these are the options and this is what you can do. And these are the best suited dosing, you know, parameters based on X, Y, and Z. Sure. But I don't know, it'll be some time before you can measure the qualitative lift. Like what is the human being lift of this chemo regimen or, 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 or what have you. And I know you're not trying to replace the physician, but what you are trying to do, as you beautifully said, was how do I just make sure that the human aspect of medicine doesn't continue to get lost? And that's what you're seeking out today is like, what, you know, and I'm curious, what are those things? What are the things that you see in front of you and are just like, this one can go, this one can go, this can be substituted, this like, you know, IT, or sorry, tech and, and innovation can handle. What are some of those things that you get excited about uh, that currently are, are truly problematic? You know, there's there's a lot of them. I think the, the most exciting things to me are the relationship between a provider and a patient. So I'll give an example. I have a pup and I take a pup to a vet and I get a checkup. What happens? Three days later, the vet calls me. Hey, how's Wolfie doing? How's that medicine working? Have you ever had that happen with a provider? No. Why? Because providers don't have time. Providers are buried. And what we've done in healthcare is we've sort of moved into a mode of when you're sick, call the doctor, right? Well, it would be nice if it was the other way around where you actually had a relationship with your provider and they helped keep you healthy rather than treating you when you were sick. You know, I think that that occurs in other industries, but in healthcare, it hasn't. Now, value-based care is beginning to shift things that direction, but I think AI is going to have the most profound impact where we can establish maintain and enrich a relationship between the provider and the patient so that patients don't, you know, put up with that pain for an extra six months and it turns into some catastrophic problem. But rather, let your provider know right when you have it, and then you can actually try to prevent it from getting worse. That is what I really want to have happen from AI. And, and the way you see that happening fairly quickly is to just take away a lot of the time manip uh, monopolization that occurs with everything that's outside of that. So that the hope is, you know, because with cancer, we have, you know, four, six week wait times, right? So before they can even get the cancer managed, but, but even in a preventative sense, in a primary sense, you're like, let me take out a lot of the burden to free up and, and let breathe the time to have attention to things, not just in a best case scenario for today, reactive manner, but but a preventative and, and fostered, you know, relationship manner. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things we're doing at Affinion. You know, we, we attacked one of the problems where if you look at where does a doctor spend a lot of time every day, and a PCP will spend a couple of hours every day in their clinical inbox. And that's very different than you and I's inbox. I mean, we get a lot of mail and email and stuff, but a doctor's getting lab results, patient messages, prescription renewals, but they're getting hundreds of things every day. And unfortunately, they can't wait till Saturday to catch up like sometimes we do. You know, they'll, they have, you know, literally patient lab results coming in and they need to get back to those. So what most doctors end up doing is they get up early and they spend a little time in the inbox and then they squeeze in a little bit between patients and then they stay up late at night trying to catch up. And then the next day it starts again. And what that does is it kind of wears down doctors. After a while, you're just running as fast as you can run and it just becomes tiresome and that's creating burnout with physicians. And that's a pretty big problem. Right now, there's a projected shortage of about 100,000 doctors in 2030. And if you imagine, like, today it's pretty hard to get an appointment. Imagine what it will be like with a shortage like that. So we're attacking the inbox problem using AI to help providers to get through their inbox faster and equipping them to do a better job. And I think that's the key with AI. If you can put the key pieces of information out on the table so the doctor can see them easily, they can make a great decision. And AI has this ability to digest a huge volume of data and surface the things that's really important for the provider so they can use their clinical expertise in the right area rather than worrying about doing some mundane thing that's not going to help a patient. And I think that's really where AI can shine. So you're speaking on, on maybe labs specifically because 
correct? Is that what you're alluding to? Yeah. Because, because I mean, I'll tell you, that's, my wife and I, she's also an oncologist. Every single night for the last six years is is kids go down, 9 p.m., laptops open, and we are working on notes and going to inboxes until we literally fall asleep with a laptop on our lap. Every time, every single night. And you're exactly right with Saturday and Sundays. Who's watching the kids on which day so that the other person can literally sit down, take three coffees, and try to catch up on all the documentation and uh, and the labs and everything else? I uh, took the 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 first Harvard um, AI strategies and implementation uh, course, AI in healthcare, and my capstone project was actually exactly that as it relates to something as what I think as a hematologist, so that's one of my specialties, is a CBC. Like I can look at a CBC and immediately know based on, not just by itself, but even by itself a lot of times, but especially before, if there's an iron deficiency that developed, a B12 deficiency, a folate, I'm always talking about B12 because metformin, which a lot of Americans are on because I personally think it's a good drug, you know, 30% will get B12 deficient over, over chronic use. But guess what? They're also diabetics. So there's so many patients that are being told their neuropathy is from worsening diabetes, even though their A1C is 5.5 or 6. And now starting to get a little of, of the central nervous, you know, stuff. And, and nobody has noticed that they're B12 deficient. And there's two things. One, it could just be a big cell. But two, if it's if there's a bigness that occurred from their baseline, then it's still cluing you in, even if it's not going to get flagged in Epic or whatever, because it's not necessarily big enough. So obviously, as a hematologist teaching people, I'm like, look, this is obvious. Like there's a standard deviation of increase in the size or decrease in the size. I could do that all day. But right now, my box is all the CLL patients that I'm watching with that have lymphocyte counts or white counts of 30,000, 40,000, flag, 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 flag every time. Every CKD patient that lives at a creatinine of 1.8, flag, 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 flag. So obviously, the flag stuff is just useless when you're seeing 20 patients a day, like, you know, like my wife and I are, and especially cancer patients at that, where there is, I freak out about every liver number and kidney number and sodium because immune therapy alone can cause sodium shifts because of brain stuff. Lung cancer can cause... I mean, it's endless. Yep. So I am obsessed with this with this thought, and I don't know why it hasn't happened yet, to be honest, on how can you just start whacking away at the stuff that a hematologist will be able to tell you, a nephrologist looking at the sodium and chloride changes over time, and the bicarbonate, which always tells me sleep apnea, at least makes me think about it when it's going up for no reason. People are like, oh, I don't know. And then I start questioning, not as their primary... Sure enough, sleep apnea is full blown, right? Yeah. And when the obesity was justified that they couldn't get it off. Anyway, I could go on forever about this. <laughs> so so you're helping this situation. Is that am I hearing you correctly? Exactly. So so imagine this scenario. If every provider could have a dedicated assistant to triage their inbox and they could tell that assistant, hey, do these things. And when you see this, I want to see it. Otherwise, you take care of it. That would be great. But obviously, budgets won't allow that. So what we've done is we created an AI agent that costs $2.50 a day, and it will triage your inbox 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it'll implement the protocols that you tell it to implement. So you can say, hey, if things are normal, I want you to handle these normal labs, but not if something moves, like let's say you have a PSA and it moves a lot, but still within the normal range. Well, I want to see that. So we've actually programmed an AI agent to do that, to implement a set of protocols and act like your assistant, but actually handle those. And we can handle clinically insignificant abnormals. And then for those that are really abnormal, we go through and analyze the lab and insert things that would be super helpful, like you mentioned, like a CKD calculation or an ASCVD. We actually put that in, we summarize the labs, we trend them, and all of that's prepared for you. So now when you sit down to go through those clinically significant abnormals, you can go through them a lot faster because we're surfacing the things that are clinically significant to you. And by doing that, you now can actually think about more important things. It's just exactly like surfacing or sort of putting a spotlight on things. We can digest the entire 10 years of history for a patient. We can digest the entire set of lab panels. And we can bring that to you in a way that you can now really, really help that patient. And before you didn't have that, right? How long would you take to read 10 years of history on a patient? You know, it's, it's long. We can do that in three seconds. So we I mean, can actually surface so, that. That's just so incredible because, you know, one of my big kind of soapboxes has always been iron deficiency. And there's been a couple of publications or two now that have come out that in young females, it actually shows not only a morbidity, but mortality difference to be iron deficient 
even without anemia. So meaning your hemoglobin is normal, your hematocrit's normal, but iron deficiency, we know for decades, causes irritability, depression, fatigue that just can't be explained, restless legs at night that keep people, you know, from being able to fall asleep. And literally they're on three central acting agents, sedators that keep them out of it the whole next day. All of this without recognizing simply iron deficiency. Because again, if somebody lives at at, at the size of a 93 is, is the MCV we use like for red blood cells, that's normal. But if somebody is 78 or 76, and love steak, they might be able to keep themselves afloat to not get anemic. But if they're looking at 78 and 93, they're both normal. And you would just never know unless you see a hematologist. And if the hematologist has time to listen to you and hear about all those things that, that you're talking about, when oftentimes we're also handling the cancer patient, right? And, and that's extraordinary because then you can have all this validation on why, you know, these things should be checked or considered in settings that are overextended. I don't think it's going to put any kind of guilt or blame on primary doctors because primary doctors are a colossal amount of work that they have to do and they have to triage the scariest stuff first, the most reactive stuff first. Why are you on oxygen? To, you're telling me something that's a normal CBC, but actually like turns out to be iron deficient, that deficiency that somebody carries the symptoms of for, for years, it's still so qualitatively insulting uh, or, or detrimental. And I think that's unbelievably exciting because on top of that, it can actually go to the to the whole premise of preventative stuff because, you know, and I did this to myself, but when I see an iron deficiency patient, my question is why, right? Because you don't just get iron deficient without getting, you know, small bowel surgery or if you have cycles, sure. But if you always had cycles and all of a sudden you're deficient, that's still weird. If you're a male, you know, I go the whole way. I check urine, I check for blood, I check the colonoscopy. You have to do this. But you're not going to get penalized. The current way right now, nobody's going to know that you missed that until it was a problem, right? Because it was too hard to tell. But the truth is, if you had all day to figure it out, you could. Well, that's where AI can help. Again, it's it's like having a, a dedicated assistant that can speed read, right? I mean, think about that. If you if you had your own MA student sitting there and, and they could literally do whatever you wanted them to do, nonstop, every day, 24 hours a day, that's what AI is like. And I think people's impression about AI... It's no different than any other tool. You know, we now have MRIs. We have all kinds of machines that can do things that help us as providers. The question is, is AI going to take over the world? No, it's going to be another tool. We'll use it appropriately. And it will level up providers because they don't have to do those things that don't really require their clinical expertise. They can focus on the things that matter. And that's absolutely going to make a difference in healthcare. That's why I'm so excited because we have this amazing new tool. 